Okay, awesome. I'm Nate Upham. I'm here to introduce Tom Stewart, our speaker for today. Um, I've got the good fortune of, of meeting Tom in graduate school at, at U Chicago. Actually, I got to help recruit Tom because he was, I started in 2008 and he started in 2009. So all the, I remember the intro visits. Yeah. Um, he went on to study with Michael Coates at U Chicago in the Organismal Biology and Anatomy program. He graduated in 2015 and then went straight into a postdoc in Gunter Wagner's lab at Yale University. I'd had, yeah, so I graduated a year before and then went to a short postdoc and then went to Yale also. Uh, and so Tom and I got to overlap again for a couple of years, which was fun in New Haven. And then Tom went back to Chicago and was in the lab of Neil Shubin for another, it was like three years, right? Uh, before starting his assistant professor job at Penn State last August. And um, so Tom, Tom's here to give the, this seminar and we also are going to be working on finishing a project together about the, the co-evolution of mammae number and litter size in mammals. So you can ask Tom questions about um, about mammal nipples or variation in them, which mammals have odd or even number nipples. Uh, he's a font of wisdom about many things, including mud skippers, and I'll let Tom take it away. Thank you, Nate. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. And those on Zoom, I appreciate you as well, even if I can't see you. Um, so I'm an evolutionary and developmental biologist. I'm interested primarily in the evolution of anatomy. Should I be louder? Yeah? Okay. Um, interested in the evolution of anatomy. And almost all of my research has focused on fins and limbs, appendicular systems. They're really nice if you're interested in how new anatomical systems originate because we have the ability to interrogate them experimentally in the lab. We can do work on zebrafish or some chondrichthians like skate. Um, but also they have a tremendous fossil record, which allows for you to try to bring these different data types together to integrate between data from deep time as well as experimental work happening in the lab. Um, the other appendicular system that I work on that Nate mentioned is mammae. Nipples are a really underappreciated appendicular system, really complex anatomically, sensory, musculature, all kinds of really fun things. And their origination as a new character really transformed, I would say, the history of life on Earth. It's a major trait. And so that's, you know, the kind of the excuse to be here, but um, something we can talk about over beers or another time. Today, right now, though, I'm going to be talking not about really skeletal systems, not about appendicular systems that much, more about behavior. That's sort of the framing of this talk. I'm going to use this talk as an excuse to get into a few things that are related to humans in the sense that these are fundamental behaviors of ours, um, not explicitly medical, but have implications for the way that we think about our own bodies and our physiology. So the subjects of the talk today are going to be focusing on locomotion, and specifically the quadrupedal gait, the origin of walking in early tetrapods, and also the origin of blinking as a behavior that a project we didn't anticipate would have this angle, but turns out we think to be really intimately related to the transition to life on land. But before I get into those data, before I get into those projects, I just wanted to give you some context for the sort of timeline of events that we're thinking about. In the late 90s, there were a bunch of really important discoveries in the field of vertebrate paleontology. We got a number of new specimens like this creature right here called a canthostega. It's one of the earliest animals with fingers and toes, uh, as well as new specimens of ichthyostega, which allowed for fully fleshing out the postcranial anatomy and really sort of discovering what the first limbed vertebrates looked like. At that time, we had a tremendous amount of information about the early tetrapodomorph condition, the early tetrapod fish condition. These are the animals that are more closely related to you than to lungfishes. That species right there, that genus, excuse me, used the nopteron. We have over a thousand specimens. We know them from, you know, 40 fold range in size. They're all over Northern Canada. They're really, really abundant and we know it incredibly well. But this intervening space right here between the limbed vertebrates and the early tetrapod condition is something that we knew a lot less about. Now, we did have specimens. We had I mean, 100 years of research of fossils being collected, but we didn't really have three-dimensional full-body animals that could fill that void and explain how some of these major transitions anatomically were happening. There's a lot of changes that are happening as animals were evolving to live on land. And these include the origin of digits and the fin-to-limb transition, the separation of the head from the shoulder, allowing for independent mobility of the head and the emergence of a functional neck, 
transformations to the postcranial skeleton, like the expansion of the ribs, you can see that the ribs of this fish are small little pegs that are straight and uniform, whereas here they are large and wrapping ventrally around the viscera um, with a degree of differentiation from head to tail. And we also have a major transition in the size and organization of the hind fins or the pelvic fins um, that you see in early tetrapods as having this large pelvic girdle and fins, or excuse me, limbs that are approximately equal in size, whereas here there's a much larger pectoral fin and a much smart, smaller pelvic fin. We also see adaptations that we think are related to locomotion and perhaps load-bearing behaviors, movement on um, semi-terrestrial or terrestrial environments in the earliest tetrapods, including the regionalization of the vertebrae there. Um, so those specializations happening throughout the skeleton are really important for this transition and trying to find animals that could tell us how that occurred became the you know mission of a handful of scientists. And so I'm gonna talk about one specimen, um, one species right now. That's sort of where a lot of my work sits. I'll just quickly say the lab sits at this interface of the water to land transition using living species as well as fossil data, trying to explain all of these character changes and the emergence of many novel features. So in 1998, a series of expeditions to Northern Canada were launched, uh, led by Ted Deschler at the Philadelphia Academy of Natural Sciences and Neil Shubin, who was at the University of Chicago. Uh, at the time, they were going into what was just a brand new sort of political entity, none of it. This is the largest indigenous uh, sort of sovereign part in the world. Um, the Canadian government gave control to the none of it territory um, to the community members, to the people of none of it in the late 90s. And so it was a really interesting time to be going up there because the entire political landscape was changing. And the reason they went is because on this island here, it's called Ellesmere Island, there are exposures that are about 380 million years old. Now this, in that window that I showed you, that bracket is exactly where you hope to find animals that are in that gap. At the time, this would have been a sort of tropical floodplain environment um, exactly the kind of environment where you expect to find animals that would have filled the niche related to this water to land transition. So it's targeted geographically, or excuse me, geologically, as well as ecologically, as a place where they hope to find these animals. And there were a series of expeditions, um, some not fruitful, some more fruitful, uh, in which you basically end up at a Canadian military base. You take your helicopter, they drop you off, and they leave you for the summer. Um, when you're there, it's 24 hours of sunlight, you're in your tents and you just go hiking and you look on the ground trying to find these specimens. Most of the time, what you're doing is you hike up and down these ridges in the valleys is you find little bits of bone, little bits of fossil that are exposed on the surface. And what you find are the mineralized tissues like bones and teeth, and they can just be scattered. And you collect these, you bring them back to camp, you analyze them, you keep track of them. And sometimes if you're lucky, you find larger specimens. So right here, you see that red arrow that's indicating the underside of a lower jaw of an animal. And when you find these larger specimens, you can excavate them back, put them in a box, fly them back to the States, and you spend years physically preparing them. So it took about two years to expose this specimen, which would become sort of the crown jewel of all those expeditions. It was named Tiktaalik rose. Uh, Tiktaalik is from the Inuktitut word, which is the language of the Inuit, um, that means large freshwater fish. So this was the type specimen I'm showing you here, but it's known from about 30 individuals. Uh, they are large fish. They could be up to about six, six to eight feet long. Um, so large predatory piscivores. And we've been studying this animal and these specimens for the last 20 years now. So Tiktaalik is really, really interesting. And I think important for understanding the history of vertebrates because it sits right at this nexus where we have a whole suite of anatomical changes happening. We also have three dimensionally preserved materials. We have many of them across the size range and incredibly a pretty complete postcranial skeleton, which is something that we haven't had for any of the other species that fit in this space. Now, I'm only mentioning Tiktaalik. There's a handful of other taxa that are known from just a fin or just a jaw, that kind of thing. The other reason Tiktaalik is important is it become kind of this icon for science communication. When people talk about evolution, oftentimes they want these case studies that you can put in a textbook. Um, and it's become, you know, memefied over the, the last several years. People come and sort of make jokes about Tiktaalik all the time. But that's another important dimension of this work is that it allows for communication of scientific principles. Um, and so that's something we're trying to embrace in this research. 
but that meme does capture truth. A certain amount of real biology is there. These animals, like Tiktaalik and other early tetrapods, were living right at the cusp of the water to land transition, right at the edge of the water. We see anatomical features that are basically intermediate to a fully aquatic animal and things that we, anatomical features we associate with life on land. There's other things that we're pulling out of these expeditions too. Last year, we described a new Elpistus tegalian, so a very close relative of Tiktaalik. This one's notable because it's smaller. It has a very different fin. The way that its muscles are all organized is completely different. Um, that shows sort of a degree of ecological breadth that we didn't anticipate in these animals. Uh, we think this was a creature that was living not just pushing off the ground, but based on the organization of the humerus, something that would have been more adapted for swimming. So sort of a secondary emergence back up from the bottom of the water column into open water. This is something you see in amphibians all the time, frogs all the time, but we just didn't have materials. They're really hard to find. And this is now decades after this original expedition. We're still making discoveries about what it includes. Um, but it's nice because it also, you know, was exactly that meme right there. So we put that out and people were, I think, able to understand the idea that these animals were not just unidirectionally marching onto land. There's a whole breadth of variation here that we're really only now just starting to get a grapple on. Okay, so that's the context. Those are the specimens, that's the species. Uh, I'm gonna talk today about a new data set. We've got it written up, submitted, hopefully out soon, on the postcranial skeleton of Tiktaalik. There is the type specimen, that's that red arrow I was showing you from before, the chin, that same animal, now out of the ground. Um, a lot of work has been done describing the head and the pectoral fin and the shoulder girdle of this animal. But now we're able to reevaluate these original materials, CT scan them, and see for the first time a whole set of new details, including the vertebrae. So this is the first ability to describe the vertebral column of Tiktaalik. These are the data. And they also reveal a whole net set of new traits in the ribs, which we didn't have before. All the original drawings were based on the anterior, maybe six or eight ribs. Now we have a series of, I think, 54 in the specimen. So a really, a really rich data set. There's also new details of the pelvic fin as well. So after, gosh, a whole winter in a pandemic of segmentation, trying to process these data, put it together. Now we have this model that we can reassemble and try to understand how it changes our understanding of ana anatomical transitions in this period, and then trying to put that in the context of locomotion and function. Uh, so we have now a description of the vertebrae that allows for sort of characterization of the various parts of the vertebrae of these animals. They have inner centra at the bottom, and you can see from head to tail, there's little differences in the size and shape and relative position of these elements. Anteriorly, they're rounding higher up. Eventually, they're more robust and a little squatter. We also have a description of the neural arches. That's the part that sits above the notochord. And you can see here, there's different types of vertebrae along the series. But I just want to call your attention to this major transition in the anatomical pattern that happens here, where we see the emergence of a foramina on that dorsal part. That happens on vertebrae 32. Just keep that in mind, the position. We also now have the full rib series that we can begin to assemble into a 3D model and try to understand how these relate to the vertebral pattern. And also here we see at position 32, uh, pretty dramatic changes in the position of the ribs. Now this concurrent change in rib and vertebral anatomy is something that we predict to be related to the position of the pelvis. In this specimen, the pelvis was previously described, but it was found next to the animal. It wasn't in articulation. And so when we look now at this species and put it in the context of Eustinopteron, that typical fishy fish that we have a lot of from northern Canada, Ichthyostega and Acanthostega, those animals I mentioned in the beginning, we can sort of understand that the vertebral column is not that different in terms of number of elements um, and the position of where the pelvis likely was. This allows us to now take a new scan of the pelvis, put it together, and what we're arguing is this animal, Tiktaalik, had a ligamentous association between the ribs and the axial and the pelvic uh, appendage, excuse me. This transition from having a contribution of the hind fins to uh, a direct linkage into the axial column and sort of support, contributing to the support of the body and perhaps propulsion from the hind limbs is one of the major transitions in the locomotor uh, mechanics of these animals. Because if you remember early on in the fishes, they're basically just pectoral fins and tiny little pelvic fins used for steering. In the first tetrapods, we see really um, elaborated pelvic fins, pelvic, pelvic excuse me, appendages, um, and a big sacrum as well. And so all of this transition in pelvic anatomy 
is happening in fin vertebrates. It's happening in a fully aquatic context. And it allows for a new reconstruction, these data, um, in which the hind fins are significantly more posteriorly positioned than we thought previously. There's more things to the story about, you know, uh, flexibility at the back of the neck that we didn't anticipate and a new pelvic uh, data set that allows for a redescription of the pelvic fin. Um, but in the context of this talk, I'm just going to focus on the fact that now, applying these new technologies to these classic specimens, we can, for the first time, have information about the posture of the animal, about the position of its pelvis, uh, and a new interpretation in which the hind fins are far more posterior than we previously thought. So what does that tell us about walking, or how can we use this to make inferences about the evolution of walking? Um, well, at least now we have a more, I think, resolved anatomical series of steps in which we first see transitions to the ribs, where they are expanded laterally, extending posteriorly behind the pelvis into the tail, um, and becoming regionalized with a sacral module that allows for a ligamentous connection to the pelvic fins. We also see later in tetrapod phylogeny, as you approach the crown, uh, the specialization of neural arches and the vertebrae themselves. So we've been able to separate those components and that allows for reconsideration of the mechanics of these animals. The reason this is so, I think, important right now is that there's been a long-standing conversation about when walking might have first evolved. And some of this is rooted in the anatomy of preserved specimens, and some of it is or rooted in ichnofossils, so trace fossils, including fossil footprints. Um, this is a fossil trackway that was described over a decade ago now, in which the authors argued because there is no trace of the belly being dragged, this is an animal that must have had a sacrum, therefore it must have been a tetrapod. And therefore they're tying the origin, the timing of this entire group, millions of years before we have specific material skeletal elements, evidence of it. Um, but with these data now, we can sort of put Tiktaalik back in the context and start to ask, is this anatomical feature, is this structure, sufficient to allow any kind of body support? Is this something that could be compatible with these early fossil trackways? What are we gonna do about it? And so right now we're continuing collaborations with bioroboticists and uh, biomechanists trying to understand exactly what the implications of a soft tissue sacral connection are. Um, but that's that story, that's where we're at right now. I know this is a medical context of like a human medicine, so I was trying to figure out what do we do. Like if you ever have lower back pain, this is like the first animal that might have had lower back pain, okay? There, there's that connection. The other thing we try to do with this research is that we try to disseminate it as broadly as possible. So I mentioned this was collected on the land of the Inuit. Um, and for that reason, we try to be fully sort of open with these data. All the scans for the fossils are available. All the 3D models are available. If any of you are teaching things that relate to osteology or evolutionary biology, or if you just want to print these things for your own uh, self-benefit, you're welcome to. We have them all on the lab as well, on the lab website as well. We also make uh, significant efforts to continue a conversation with the communities of Ellesmere Island. It's a really remote place, um, about 80 something degrees latitude north. It is the 10th biggest island in the world. There's only two towns there, each have about 100 people. So it's really, really uh, resource limited. It's mostly a hunter-gatherer community. And it's really critical for us as scientists to maintain that connection, to make sure that they understand you know, why we want to be there um, so that they can, you know, hopefully continue to support this type of research. And so we do work with the Center for um, Culture and Heritage, translating a lot of our research and the primary findings of our publications so that they can directly access it as well. So that's one side of things. That's one sort of aspect of what the lab is up to, trying to interrogate fossil data, trying to understand the emergence of novel forms and use that to constrain hypotheses of mechanics and motion and behavior. This other thing I'm gonna talk about, also not appendages, it's about blinking. Now, this project did not start out, again, with an eye towards a water to land transition. Um, as with Nate, I have been fortunate to be surrounded by smart scientists and we try to collaborate and do fun projects. And this project I'm gonna to talk to you about right now uh, began in conversation with a physicist. He was at Georgia Tech and we were looking for behaviors that we could go to the zoo and just study all the animals and just watch them do these behaviors and then come up with theories about how bodies scale and how you can make generalized principles of certain types of movement. 
So we go to the zoo and we look for these behaviors, these movements. What can we come up with as a model? Um, people have done all kinds of things like how fast they shake their body when they get wet. That's something you can do that isn't very invasive. Um, people have studied how they go to the bathroom, trying to understand if there's sort of scaling laws in the urethral column or the urethral system. Um, if you need a paper on that, just Google the law of urination. There's a really cool study about that. Um, we settled on blinking as this behavior that, you know, it's really easy to see. We could just set up cameras all over the zoo and we could do this study. And what we wanted to do is come up with a framework for explaining variation in blinking. That was the mo that was the sort of goal of our project. And as soon as we dug into it, it became very clear that this was just not going to work. Animals are blinking in way too many ways and their anatomy is too varied to come up with general principles. There's almost no literature on this diversity either, which really confounded us. And so we ended up going in a different direction. Um, Blinking, I think, to set the context for this talk, is just something that people don't really think about. You don't think about it in your day. You know, you're blinking every four and a half seconds from when you wake up until when you go to sleep. You're blinking your entire life. And you don't think about it usually until it becomes interrupted and goes wrong. If you have pain in your eye, then you start to feel it. And if you have dry eyes, then you start to feel it. Um, now you're feeling it because I'm talking about it. But most of the time it goes unnoticed. And if it gets interrupted, if blinking is something that cannot happen naturally, normally, with a regular frequency, you will go blind. It is critical to the health of your eye. And I didn't appreciate that until we started getting into this project, um, until we tried, tried to explain variation in this phenomena. Um, but I, I'm going to make the case to you now that this behavior, which is part of our regular day, uh, originated during the water to land transition of tetrapods. That's the idea, that this is related to life on land, to your eyes being in the air. Now, lots of animals blink. It's not just you. Um, and animals blink in all kinds of different ways. So what is blinking? Blinking is just the periodic occlusion of the eye by a membrane. Now, which membrane it is can depend on the animal. We blink mostly by lowering our upper eyelid. If you squint really hard, you'll move both, but mostly it's by lowering your upper eyelid. Other animals blink in a completely different way by only raising their lower eyelid. But there's more to that too. Some animals will perform these blinks using third eyelids called nictitating membranes that sweep laterally across the eye. So as we were trying to think about how to measure this, we're like, well, which eyelids do we measure and how do we do the timing and what do you do when the left and the right eye don't match up and it just like kind of broke down. Besides there being a lot of variation in the membranes themselves, the glands around the eye can be quite variable. So we have a set of glands called mammobian glands and lacrimal glands and hadarian glands. Not all animals that blink have these features, and it's not even clear how they're distributed across tetrapod phylogeny. Uh, and so trying to understand you know, the basic anatomy in a comparative work is starting to break down at the start of this project. But based on the current distribution of animals that perform blinks, we think blinking evolved once at the base of crown tetrapods and has been lost a few times in living vertebrates. So a series, a number of fully amphibious, fully aquatic amphibians have lost this behavior. I'm showing here the African clawed frog, Xenopus. Um, that is one that if you stare into its eyes, it will forever stare back. It does not have eyelids. It does not perform blinks. Uh, this is not the only one. It's probably happened about two or three times within the amphibians. Outside of tetrapods, though, there are other animals that perform these behaviors that have blinks. Some of the sharks, like the group that includes great whites, have evolved independently a nictitating membrane that goes laterally around the eye. They use that primarily when they're striking and hitting prey. But blinking in fishes is not just evolved in that group. It's evolved a handful of times. Here's a guitar shark that's independently evolved the capacity to withdraw and close its eye. Whale sharks do it. Pufferfish do it. So it's happening in aquatic context too. It's not strictly a terrestrial behavior. When we were trying to figure out like how do we measure blinking frequency and what's going to be the best explanation of it, it also became clear that animals not only have a range of anatomies that underlie the behavior, they're doing it for a whole range of reasons. The literature primarily emphasizes wetting as the phenomena that is most important. Sorry, flashing off of the zoom screen. Um, as most important for blinking behaviors. Does anybody know why you want to have a wet eye? Why we have the issue of dry eyes as a condition of discomfort? Most of us take for granted that our eyes are wet, but there are physiological reasons. There are hypotheses as to why. The primary one is that our eyes in the front, the cornea, is not vascularized. So we do not have blood vessels. Most of the cells in your body get their oxygen through gas exchange that happens through your circulatory system. 
But in the front of the eye, in order to maintain optical transparency, we don't have blood vessels. And in aerial environments, the hypothesis goes, that's the best of our understanding, this fluid membrane is critical for having oxygen diffusion into the cornea. So just as your lungs are wet to allow for the dis, uh, diffusion of gas particles into your body, so too does this wet uh, surface need to be preserved in order to have gas diffusion so that your eyes don't, or your, excuse me, your corneal epithelial cells don't die. And that is the idea as to why um, you might go blind, for example. Yeah, please, if you can't blink normally. Yeah. So there's, I don't talk about the immune system in this, but there is a whole host of reasons why um, animals do blink. It's not strictly to keep an eye wet for that reason. It's also sometimes to remove particles from the eye, to keep the eye clean. That's the other predominant hypothesis. Um, you've probably been in a windy environment where something gets brushed in, or if you have an eyelash that gets into your eye, you will start blinking, you will start tearing up because of that. So cleaning the eye is a really important part of this behavior. It's one of the hypothesized reasons why it might have first evolved. It's also important for protection. So if somebody were to throw a softball at you, you will close your eyes. You have this visual cue that indicates likely harm, and you will close your eyes in response to that. So there's a whole suite of reasons why animals are blinking. Um, Darwin was one of the, I think, only and first people to really consider this, and he emphasized behavior. He talked about flirtation and the importance of blinking um, in social contexts. But if you've ever slow blinked at a cat, you know that other animals are using these as cues too. So it's, you know, it's a complicated behavior. That's what I'm trying to get at, basically. Um, but based on the current distribution, we, Brett and I, who are doing this study, came to the hypothesis, or began with the hypothesis that this is related to the transition to life on land. That's primarily based on the contemporary phylogenetic distribution. The problem is it's really hard to study this question and to test this hypothesis using the fossil record because soft tissues like glands around the eye and eyelids don't preserve. All we have are the skulls. And we don't have clear osteological correlates for either of those traits. And so we were trying to figure out, you know, we spent all this time thinking about zoos, what are we going to do, reading all these papers. And we ended up coming across the description from the Journal of Ophthalmology in the 70s by the scientist who had, I think, or, uh, a doctor who had taken a vacation and come across mudskippers. Now, mudskippers are a group of semi-terrestrial fishes that live as adults almost exclusively on land. They feed on land, they court on land, they defend their territories on land. They're really, really terrestrial. They could spend you know 20 hours a day on land, if not for tides. As this ophthalmologist noted, they also have a really intriguing behavior. They blink. And so we wanted to use and study this system to interrogate whether perhaps just in our lineage, as we transition to life on land, so too these animals might be blinking because of their terrestrial behaviors. So that's where we started. We're just like, what is going on here? Why are they blinking? How are they blinking? What can that tell us about the early history of tetrapods and our own physiology and anatomy? To get at the question of how mudskippers blink, we first just took videos looking at the kinematic profiles of the eye and the lower membrane called the dermal cup. And what we found was these animals are primarily blinking just by lowering the eye and simultaneously raising this lower membrane. Now, this was a study that had 3D kinematics, but in the medial lateral dimension, there's almost no movement. So we're just going to talk about dorsal ventral movement. But when you look inside, when you look at these specimens, or excuse me, when you look at their, their anatomy, it turns out they don't have any new muscles to perform this behavior. All of the movement of the eye is happening from the same six extraocular muscles that are common to jawed vertebrates. So they've basically taken a typical fish eye, the same muscles that are around your eye, and just stretch them out and position them in different ways so that when they become activated, they can perform this behavior. And to sort of further prove that point, we looked at a number of closely related species and characterized all of that. It seems as though this up-down motion is primarily from the two uh, muscles identified there. That's based purely on the position and their orientation and insertion. Uh, but some animals like turtles can blink by the simultaneous retraction of all six extraocular muscles. So, you know, there, there may be other contributions to the system. The other part that we noted is that there isn't really any muscles to raise the eye up. What we think is happening is that as the eye is displaced into this dermal cup, this elastic membrane, when the muscles relax, that's sufficient to push it back up. Um, that's our current hypothesis, at least, as to how the eye opening mechanism works. We also wanted to test whether there has been the convergent evolution of glands around the eye. Do they, like we, have tear glands? And so we looked at 
uh, micro CT data as well as histological data. And it turns out that there isn't any multicellular, you know, new structure there. These animals have basically just kept the typical fishy skin um, and somehow are blinking with that, which raises the question, maybe they're doing it for other reasons. Are they using it for wetting? Are they using it for cleaning? Why are they performing this behavior? But to quickly summarize the anatomy side of things, the mechanics of this are the simultaneous lowering of the eye and raising of an eyelid. And this has happened by the co-option and modification of the existing architecture, the musculoskeletal architecture of the goby fish, of the typical jawed vertebrate condition. Um, no new glands, no new muscles. As somebody who studies novelty, this was kind of disappointing because I was waiting for a brand new organ. I'm like, that's going to be my system. And they're just like a little bit different. Um, but the behavior is novel, so it still counts. It still gets to be included in my portfolio. So why are they blinking? Well, the next thing we did was do a series of experiments trying to interrogate those main hypotheses. I know you mentioned immunology as well. It's not something we've interrogated at all. Um, there's a lot of, I think, future directions for this work. So to first test whether this is related to wetting of the eye, we built, or some really incredible undergrads who are biophysicists, built these evaporation chambers uh, in which they increase the airflow through the space and you can model how what effect that'll have on evaporative conditions in curved fluids. And they did all this simulation to show basically under these conditions, we can have expected evaporation of an order of magnitude higher than you would have under regular room conditions without this airflow. And so what we did was just put them in these tanks. And sometimes we'd put them in with the high evaporation condition with the airflow first, sometimes with just regular room conditions first. And we would just count how many seconds between each blink. And when you do that counting, you can come up with an inner blink interval. That's the amount of time between each individual blink. You can think of it as the inverse of the blink rate, but it's just easier to quantify that way. So this is what we did. We just put them in these chambers. We watched them closely. Oh, how beautiful. And then we just collected this data with a handful of animals that we had in the lab. And what we found is, to our great surprise, I don't know if we expected this or not, to our, it's exciting to me, <laughs> whatever the result was, that uh, evaporation does in fact affect the behavior. It does induce um, faster inner blink or lower inner blink um, measures that is a faster frequency of these behaviors. So yes, this does seem to be related to drying. It does seem to be related to wetting, despite the fact that they don't have these glands. So how are they doing it? Well, the other thing that we observed is under the high evaporation conditions, they also began to perform this rolling behavior. The bottom of the tank had a thin layer of water. And when they were sort of stressed out, when they had this high evaporation, they began rolling their faces, basically covering their head in the tank water. And so what we think is happening is that this is a wetting mechanism in which under high evaporation conditions, they will perform it at greater frequency. Um, some of the animals for like a full hour didn't roll once, and then you put them in the tank with evaporation. They were doing it a, a whole lot. And so we think this also is related to drying and blinking, and that the way that these animals are maintaining a tear film, the way that they're maintaining a fluid film on their eyes, is through a combination of typical secretions that fishes have, they're slimy, as well as the recruitment of environmental moisture, of environmental fluids, to through this rolling behavior to keep this fluid. Which means if you want to imagine the evolvability of this lineage, in a sense, right now, they're pretty tied to aquatic environments. They can't go that far off into land because without environmental water to keep their eyes moist, they might suffer injuries to their eye. They might have this corneal scarring um, in the same way that we do if we can't blink. The next thing we wanted to test is whether this behavior is also related to cleaning, the second main hypothesis as to the origin of blinking. And Mudskippers in the wild are dirty. They're just in the mud. They're rolling around all the time. Um, that's why they have their name, mudskippers. And in order to try to replicate this in the lab, we began sprinkling brine shrimp. This is a non-irritating um, sand, approximately sand-sized material. And as you can see, when they blink, they are really effective at cleaning their eyes. A single blink can basically fully clear the cornea. Um, and how effectively they were um, cleaning this away and found, you know, th this simple system, you know, despite not having new glands, despite not having new muscles, is really effective at cleaning the eye. The next thing we wanted to test is whether this is also related to protection. So to do that, um, the students, again, designed these rigs where you have a robotic arm that comes in and it touches the fish in the eye. 
And as soon as it touches a fish, it stops moving. And just like your cell phone has the ability to detect skin contact, so too does this little probe. And this capacitance sensor would set off a light so that you would know as soon as the contact was made. And then we would record the kinematic profile and timing of all of this. So we had the ability to know exactly when it touched it, that it was not going beyond that, that it was only slightly contacting the cornea. And then we could record the profile. And as you could see from that video right there, there is a response. Every time you hit the cornea, the corner of the eye with this little probe, it induced a blink behavior. We compared it then to the regular blinks, just how fast are these things happening? And it turns out that these induced blinks, these mechanically induced blinks, are faster than your regular spontaneous blinks. So you have a different kinematic profile. The other thing that we did was compare it to humans in the rate at which this happened. So because we can say exactly when the blinking was initiated, we can then, when the contact was initiated, and because we could start to measure precisely when the timing of movement began, we could calculate this lag time between the induction of the behavior and the sort of the, in the stimulus and the induction of the behavior. And what we found was that um, these animals begin to blink extremely quickly at 28 milliseconds, which if you do this exact same experiment in humans is the same time course of a human corneal reflex. So we have the ability to blink through different mechanisms. If you think about it, you can blink, but you also have a reflexive arc that can happen when you stimulate the cornea. And what we think is happening here is that mudskippers have independently evolved not only the ability to blink, but they've evolved a new reflex, the new capacity to perform this behavior reflexively using a totally different set of muscles than you use. Um, again, this hypothesis is based on the time course, that short lag time, as well as the distinct kinematic profile, suggesting that there's something else going on here. Okay, so now I've told you a bit about why they're blinking. First we did how, now why. I think we're on to the so what. I think some reviewers agreed that this is evidence of uh, an adaptation to life on land. I think all of these data points help us to understand that this is, in fact, a terrestrial behavior. Now, building this argument takes more than just those experiments. There's a, the literature that we referred to as well. Um, I'll first point out, mudskippers are not born on land. They are fully aquatic when they're born. And as fully aquatic individuals, as little larvae, they look just like another fish. If you've ever seen a zebra fish, that's what they look like. But when they metamorphose, their eyes vault, they come to sit on the top of the head, and this behavior can occur. This metamorphosis is also when, in their life history, they transition to life on land. So they go from being fully aquatic to being semi-terrestrial. We have a correlation within this species of life history and anatomy. We also have other animals that, in their loss of terrestrial lifestyles, have given up blinking behavior. So I mentioned Xenopus, now fully aquatic, will never come and spend lots of time on land. They have given up their eyelids and the blinking behavior. So too have axolotls. Axolotls are really fun though, because if you induce experimentally a metamorphosis in the laboratory, and if you begin to watch them change and put them on land as they will when they're induced to metamorphose, they also develop eyelids and blinking behaviors. So you have a condition where the capacity is ret retained, um, also linked to metamorphosis in amphibians, uh, so we have multiple lines of evidence now that this is linked to sort of where the animal is at the time that this behavior emerges. The other thing to take away from this is that this, I think, is a pretty novel behavior. Like there's no evidence of anything, any analog of blinking in the fishes closely related to this animal. Uh, this capacity was achieved by pretty simple anatomical changes. Basically just repositioning the eye into a new spot and having a slightly thicker bit of skin under the eye. And you've been able to, these animals have been able to achieve a whole suite of behaviors that are specific, I think, to life on land. The matter of maintaining a fluid film is clearly an aerial condition that's different from aquatic conditions. But cleaning too is quite different. The tendency of particles to adhere to wet surfaces underwater is different than wet surfaces on land. The way that things will stick to the face of an animal is fundamentally different on land. In protection too, the rate at which a small particle would accelerate towards your face underwater is just completely different than the way a small particle would accelerate to your face on land. And so the potential for harm is different in these environments. The potential for you know getting dirty, the potential for um, getting dry is just fundamentally different. And it's these suite of selective forces, forces I think, all concurrently acting on the eye that are what explain this convergent evolution of this novel behavior that characterizes our own lineage, the terrestrial tetrapods, um, as well as the mudskippers. 
So what, how do we put this in the context of early tetrapod evolution? Well, we know a little bit about the eyes of these animals. They were in early tetrapodomorph fishes on the side of the head, pretty small. That's used to Nopteron again, that Canadian fishy fish. In animals like Tiktaalik, the Elpistus degalians, those are the close relatives to the limb vertebrates. The eyes are positioned more dorsally on the head. They often have a little brow, but we don't see any major changes around the eye. And it's not until we get into the limbed vertebrates, Acanthostega, that we see the first clear anatomical shift related to the eye, uh, excuse me, related to eye soft tissue. And that is in the inner portion of the eye, we have the attachment site of a retractor bulb by muscle. So it's a new muscle evolves that we see in Acanthostega. Now that was observed before, but these data from mudskippers show that even a simple retraction mechanism and a very limited reorganization of soft tissue can be sufficient to perform a whole suite of terrestrial specific behaviors, terrestrial specific functions. And so, you know, we can't say exactly when blinking first evolved, uh, but we can say, you know, this is the first animal that had the capacity to show a specialized retraction mechanism. And that's consistent with these other changes that are happening in the eye. And I, I didn't mention it, but the position of the eye on Tiktaalik is also linked to an enlargement of the eye that has been predicted to be related to aerial vision because the way that light is collected in, in the air is going to be slightly different than in aquatic environments. Um, and Malcolm McIver has been arguing that this is the first evidence of aerial vision that we have. Um, so now we have, in the early tetrapods at least, a sort of stepwise elaboration of these components where perhaps they were first glancing out of the water, through the air. And then later, we see adaptations for a whole suite of these terrestrial behaviors. Um, not necessarily the origin of lacrimal glands or tear glands. That might have come later. And that might have been one of the key traits that was allowing these early tetrapods to evolve away from aquatic environments and have extended forays on land. Just like in mudskippers, if you don't have the capacity to produce the secretions around the eye, you're not going to go far. That's our hypothesis, at least. So this study, you know, I'm the one telling it. It was a collaboration with myself and Brett Elio, who is then at Georgia Tech, now faculty um, at Seton Hill University, and a huge army of undergraduates that were designing really important components of these experiments as well. Um, a really fun multi-year project that we put together. The other thing I'll say about this is that um, just as before, you know, we're constantly working to share this research. Um, I had the opportunity to collaborate with a award-winning novel graphic novelist uh, Jordan Culver. Um, he's really tremendous. So we shared, you know, our findings with him, and he came up with a series of panels to try to communicate it to you, um, to the world. Uh, if this is interesting to you, please check it out. Share it with kids, anybody that might be interested in it. Um, it's a really incredible case study, I think, in how you design figures. The way that graphic novelists build narrative is really, really impressive, and I think a lot of scientists could benefit from just considering the way they use you know, space, the way they use text, the way they build narratives from left to right, top to bottom. It's really fun to see what these artists are coming up with. And I, I found it very informative as well. Um, that was a fun part of the, the project. So with that, that's kind of just, you know, what the lab is up to. We're looking at the waterland transition in a variety of lenses using a number of different data types. I didn't talk about the developmental work. We also have experiments in zebrafish, that kind of thing. Today, I just focused on two behaviors, walking and blinking, that I think have relevance to this audience in the context of human health, trying to understand the origin of human conditions um, in a variety of contexts. So with that, um, just thank everybody that's supported this work, contributed to this work, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Data yeah, has to have the mic. Okay, so you're good. Okay, so, so, so in the data that showed the interblink time intervals, yes. it seemed like there was a lot of variation. Yeah. Do you have any sense of whether that's heritable between individuals? Is there any evidence for polymorphism within populations? Would that give you any insight into the selective pressures? I don't know. So before grouping the samples, we tested for differences between the individuals and found them at least to be comparable that justify the grouping and conducting the analysis at the level of that bullet sphere. Um, that is to say, we didn't detect it statistically, but there is obviously a lot going on there. And how do we explain differences in link frequency or interblink interval generally? I'm not sure what the answer to that is. I think the issue is that 
they were all done individually. I mean, I think there may be male female differences in the way that they are performing because males are a lot more, you know, dynamic, moving around. They're territorial. They're kind of, you know, they're aggro. They're just causing trouble. Um, but they also blink. Depend. I mean, tetrapods will blink at different frequencies depending on how tired they are. You know, if if this experiment was done at 4 p.m. versus 10 a.m., all of these things, you know, have the capacity to affect it. Ultimately, though, um, it's pretty clear that the treatment is driving this behavior in that one particular way, but getting into the other subtleties of what explains the variation around those major differences, we haven't begun to do that yet. Yeah, please. Uh, related to that, I was wondering if maybe like some of the variation in the intervals was related to the fact that some of them might have been doing the rolling behavior more and that yeah. was, you know, made it so that they didn't have to blink as frequently. And did you, do you have like a figure, do you have like both of those data together? We do not. Uh, yeah. We have not <laughs> analyzed them concurrently. Um, yeah. It, there is a bit of a challenge to this. So one of the things I didn't mention, just as we grouped our individuals together into a concurrent analysis, we also did left-right blinks and measured them independently and found them to be similar and um, have that as well. But roles are unilateral too. And so there is a degree to which um, probably the role to the left is affecting the eye to the right or whatever. And um, that information is all in the data, but we haven't broken it out to see specifically what their relation is. Yeah. Yeah, please. We, so we have a, a question on Zoom, um, which is, I think you said that the changes leading to limb development took place in, in the prehistoric fish, the Campostega, maybe it was, or and then in, in their aquatic environments. But the, the question is really, you know, why would that be since there's no real advantage to limbs in water? Yeah, so it seems pretty clear that the first limbed animals were very, very associated with water. Um, they had gills still. Um, they were reduced from earlier conditions, but they still had a robust gill skeleton. Um, there is some evidence that in juveniles, they may have been more aquatic and then adults had a degree of metamorphosis where you see the shape of the long bones of the limb changing at adults. So maybe there was some amount of life history variation in these earliest tetrapods that explains, you know, adaptation in later stages, later adult stages that it isn't so relevant in juvenile stages. Um, but I would say that limbs might also be quite useful underwater. Uh, a lot of these structures were probably not used strictly for like running and walking. It was just pushing and station holding. And um, a large, robust, distally expanded appendage is pretty good for pushing on the ground. The reason why animals might walk underwater versus swim underwater are not entirely clear. The energetics of them have never really been broken down to understand when it's appropriate or when it's advantageous to walk underwater. Um, but there are all kinds of animals that do that. Uh, epaulette sharks have really large fins. They walk underwater. Toad fishes do it. Uh, sea robins, in a sense, do it. And so that phenomena of wa underwater walking is something I don't think we understand very well, but has evolved in finned animals, um, I don't know, six times independently. Uh, so it's a good question as to why. And I think people still need to work on that problem. Yeah. Has this kind of work been done in other extant semi-terrestrial fish like one fish and like seeing how that can change maybe change the blink rate in a different fish because i i don't know if one fish are more terrestrial yeah, so people have been working trying to use living fish species as a model for understanding when these gates change and also how effectively animals move on land when they have fins. Um, you mentioned lungfish. It's a really a good example. They will walk underwater pretty comfortably, but a large part of the reason why they're able to do that is because they have a big set of lungs and swim bladder, and that affects their buoyancy. They have very weak little like spaghetti legs, but they can still push underwater and move through the environment. Um, the other animal where this has been most closely studied is in polypterus. This is a rave, an Actinopterygian, that uh, if you keep them in human environments, you can raise them on land. A lot of these fishes have the ability to absorb gas and to spend extended periods of time on land. Uh, and so there was a study by Emily Standen where she was raising polypterus on land and seeing how it affected the skeleton and how effectively they're moving. And so people are continuing to work on, on those systems as well. Um, I guess that's the answer is that people are trying. I, I don't know exactly how to generalize a, a result out of those studies. Um, but as with the underwater walking, I'll just make the case that it's really a difficult problem to simulate some of these things. Partially submerged fish move very differently than fully terrestrial fish. And 
a lot of these environments where the animals were living could have been, you know, low levels of water, but it's still useful to be able to push yourself between drying puddles, basically, in a floodplain. Um, or maybe you just do it when it's raining, which a lot of fish do here in I don't know if you have probably not, it's probably too dry here. Invasive snakeheads are all over the southeast, um, and they move across land just like a catfish would. Uh, but oftentimes during really high flow rain events where they can get a little bit of water, it just allows them to slide. Um, so yeah, it's a challenging question mechanically that uh, we're just starting to get a tackle. Uh, I think. Yeah. yeah, I was going to ask about this along the same lines. Yeah, yeah, you look at other aquatic fish like lungfish. But um, what about like insects? I know insects don't blink, but there's a lot of insects that are have aquatic life stage. And you know, is, there, is there anything analogous going on where they have to maintain their eyes in the way their vertebrates do? So insects have cuticular lenses or cuticular surfaces, which are, I believe, waterproof. So to that end, they don't have to deal with dehydration affecting the sort of composition of their their eye structure, which is probably why blinking has never evolved in any terrestrial insect. Now, there are some invertebrates that do blinking-like behaviors. Um, some snails, if you poke their eyes, they'll pull it into the stalk and they'll fully retract it, and there is some coverage around it. But nobody's described that mechanically or gone into exactly why they do it. You see videos online of it's just being poking a snail and then it like pulls its eye back. But um, yeah, beyond that, there isn't really an analogous visual comparison. I think. There is opportunity, though, for things like, yeah, so some animals have emergent life stages, and they will transform their eyes to be on land um, or in the air, looking in the air. I haven't really seen any studies breaking that down too carefully. There's a woman in Tulsa, University of Tulsa, who's working on that in the toe biter animals. I don't know, because you see changes in the curvature of the eye in some of these insects that suggest that there's a difference in the way that they are uh, collecting light in air through land, but that isn't published. Um, yeah, there's a lot of opportunity. I mean, crabs are going in and out of water all the time, some fully terrestrial, some fully aquatic, and so I think there is a space for generalized principles of eye evolution, but this blinking study, I didn't emphasize it too much. Like, there is nothing on blinking. This is it seems like a simple idea that this is related to life on land because we have thousands of animals that are doing it all the time for their entire lives, but there's no literature on this. And even comparative kinematics of terrestrial things, like humans, horses, chickens, and like that's that's all we have. And so, um, yeah, there's a lot of opportunity for studying eyes and how it relates to water and land. Another one online. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, are there any, um, it's, are there any, are there any terrestrial vertebrates that do not blink? Yes. Um, snakes have lost eyelids. They have a lenticular scale. If you see them shed, that's the first thing that becomes opaque. That's usually a cue that they're going to scale, uh, that they're going to shed. So they have a different mechanism of protecting the eye. The other example, I don't know if there's any others. Chameleons will, geckos will lick their eyes, but they still close their eyes. Um, so other animals will have wetting or cleaning mechanisms that are not related to blinking, but I don't know if there's any that have fully given it up. The other place where you might expect to see it are the subterranean animals. So really highly reduced animals in their visual systems will have a loss of associated structures. Cecilians, for example, I think the Cecilians have lost, there's your answer, Cecilians, they've given up eyelids. Um, I don't know if moles blink. I really want to know that. If somebody has a mole, figure it out. They're, they have eyes. They, I, I can't find a description of the eyelids. I can't find a description of if they have muscles or glands or what's going on. Things with highly reduced eyes, like the mammals that are in that condition, might have given up blinking. Um, that's the only thing I can think of. I guess the sort of related question, thinking about blinking rates yeah. and uh, sort of how that might be related to perceptual frame rates yes. as well. Um, could you comment just on like what what is known relative you know comparative basis you know within humans and across uh, primates and mammals? You mentioned like looking at going to a zoo and yeah. you could probably take some of this data for certain species. Yeah, so blinking is really important for part of the visual processing of tetrapods. The most well studied system are birds. I mentioned chicken. Um, a lot of birds, when they move their heads, when they gaze shift, they close their eyes so that when they open their eyes, they're in a new fixed position. This is thought to be a means of accommodating the visual blur of movement um, with the head. And so it's very clear that when birds are shifting their eyes, they are correlating that with the timing of their blinks. Um, outside of birds, I don't know if it's described as a 
I mean, you, you also in conversation yesterday mentioned how it relates to human perception of time. Um, the faster you blink, the faster it feels like time is passing. Um, that was new to me. So, so there might be other contexts outside of visual flow where it affects perception, uh, but I haven't seen that broken down. Yeah. Well, it's kind of maybe related um, to what was said before, but it's kind of interesting that blinking is so common, right? Mm -hmm. And that we didn't find another evolutionary solution to the problem of keeping our eyes wet yeah. generally. Whereas, so it suggests that there's just not really a cost of blinking or maybe even a benefit compared to something else, right? Can, yeah. But at the same time, you know, collectively, we spend a lot of our time with our eyes closed, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Especially a prey animal. Maybe it's short, but do you, yeah. I don't know if you've seen anything like talking about that, like what? The cost of blinking. And... Yeah. No, I, I, I think the, the motivating question for this project was explaining variation, not the origin of the behavior. And there's two quick things I'll say that I didn't say. You mentioned the time we spend with our eyes closed, just as a general piece of knowledge. There, when we sleep, we close our eyes. We don't have aerial oxygen. And the reason we don't go blind is because our eyelids are highly vascularized. So if you flip your eyelids out, you go back in the mirror, you'll see they're bright pink. Um, that's why. I didn't know that until I started this project, that closing your eyes is one of the oxygen exchange mechanisms that's related to eye health when you sleep. Um, that's just a fact that I like to share. The other is that like in humans, you're like, okay, what do you think about when it's happening and why it's happening? I just give an example that kind of breaks down, the, I think, the limits of our understanding of this. Human infants blink once every 30 seconds. Blink frequency accelerates through puberty until well, puberty, and then we have a stable blink rate until we die at four and a half to five seconds. We don't have a theory as to why that's changing. Even within our species, the best studied species for blinking behaviors, there's not a clear model for what is changing and what is explaining this order of magnitude nearly shift in the frequency of this behavior. And so then we try to look like, okay, all, all of you can imagine in, interesting ecological questions about this problem, but we, we I really think we're just starting to dig into it at all. And so I don't have an answer, honestly. Um, I'll just point out that that gap in our human understanding to, to make that point, I suppose. But yeah, I appreciate the, the want to know these things. Yeah. Yes, last one. Yeah, one thing I noticed in that clip is that one eye retracted seemed a little faster than the others. Is there a sense or some kind of pattern in terms of how independent versus correlated the two eyes are across axis? Great question. I have no idea. So some animals will tend to blink concurrently. Humans are a good example of that. Some animals do not. Um, that implies a pretty distinct neural circuitry that's involved in this regular effect and um, the ability to differentiate one side from the other. There is nothing that I've ever seen written on that behavior. There are observations of when it's happening, but we don't have a survey of it. Um, I'll, I'll mention one of the authors of this study, we came across his website. He's a retired ophthalmologist who works on uh, facial pathologies. And he, as doctors often are at the end of his life, had the resources to study this in the way that he wanted. So he retired and now he just goes around to the world zoos, the best zoos in the world, and he just videotapes all these animals. And he's been building a catalog of hundreds of species of all the birds, basically. Every bird he can get his camera on, he's been collecting it just because he wants to know what's happening. And he's been sharing these data with us and he helped us to write the paper. He's a really tremendously insightful guy. Um, but I think that's the kind of thing we need is we just have to begin surveying the basics of this behavior before we can coming up with theories about how we explain scaling or evolutionary patterns in that regard. Um, the concurrent versus independent blink, it's a great question. We don't have an answer to that now. Cool, thank you.